Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gino, how's it going? Jake, I'm doing good. How you doing, bro? Always making it happen, big man. Today, we have a special edition of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. We're going to take a deep dive into the book that started it all, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. We're going to discuss how these principles apply to multifamily investing and business success overall. In my opinion, 98% of all business and motivational books out there have grown or developed from Mr. Hill's ideas. So without further ado, co-host G-Daddy Papa Funk, Mr. Man of the World, what do you think? Uh, I think 98% might be a little low. Maybe it's 99%. (laughs) Right. I mean, if you take a look, I mean, these guys with new technologies coming out, they're able to like expand on his principles. We didn't know that much about the brain back in the 1930s. Right, Jake. Now we know a lot more. But it's amazing what his speaking about the you know subconscious and about infinite intelligence has brought us forth. Now you listen to Tony Robbins, you listen to Zig Ziglar. They're basic fundamentals. We just take them for granted because we hear them. But, you know, he's actually sat down. For 25 or 30 years, and was actually interviewing these people, and we're going to get onto it. But the amazing part about it is he positioned himself as an expert, not by being rich, but by talking to people who are rich. And we're going to, I guess, dive into that, Jake, also, because a lot of real estate investors want to know, how do I get credibility? Well, surround yourself with people who are in the business. Create value for yourself and then bring value. And I think that's what that's what Napoleon Hill did. He was able to get all these guys in a room. He interviewed them all. He got a lot of information from them. And the most important thing was he laid out his plans. He had a definite purpose for what he was doing, but he laid out his plans. And as you can see, and we're going to talk about it, his journey wasn't easy, Jake. Everyone thought he was nuts. People were like, what are you, crazy? You don't know anything about money. What are you writing about money? Why would, you, why would Dale Carnegie want to speak to you? And I think he just killed the naysayers, right? Very few people would have been able to do that. He put decades into this work. Did he know he was going to be successful? I don't know. But I think his definite purpose made this thing a success. And the fact that he became so educated about it, he had that specialized knowledge. He put everything together and he bundled it into a framework like you and I have, buy right, manage right, finance right. He had these 13 steps. And I want to dive into each one of these 13 steps because I think it's crucial. I think everyone should read the book at least once a year. January 1st pops up read the book. And then you know what? Middle of the year, come back to Jake and Gino. I have a book review on it. You don't want to read it all? Read that book book review because it's so crucial. All these 13 steps. And as you get older in your journey, Jake, you're going to see yourself, wow, I never really thought about it. I really never thought about organized planning or I never really thought about the desire or about the faith. You start growing these things and you start implementing in your life and you see how much you know, you'll be able to expand and how much you'll be able to take away from the book. This is the Bible of business success books. There's no doubt in my mind. Hey, let's jump into this. So he had 13 <clears throat> steps, right? The first one was desire. What, what did he say about desire? Um, you know, he had a great story in, in, in the book. It was with Edward C. Barnes. Edward C. Barnes was a poor guy, poor as in not having any money, not having a job. But he had the desire not to work for Thomas Edison. He had the desire to become his partner and go into business. And anyone would say to himself, how is this guy going to do that? He's got no job. He's got no skills. Why would Edison want to be partnered with him? But he had that desire. And I remember reading in the book, he went to go meet Edison. And Edison said he saw something in his eyes that made him believe that he would do something. So Edwin Barnes was not distraught when, when Edison said, you know, I'm not going to be your partner, but I'll give you a job. He knew that he had to start somewhere. So it's from that desire that he had that he had to do anything menial, anything to get it done. That's what me and you did when we first took our first property. We took whatever property that looked good. We jumped in there. We rolled up our sleeves. We had that desire. So when the septic systems failed, Jake, what did we do? We didn't cry. We didn't say multifamily stinks. We said, you know what? That's part of the journey. Our desire is to improve our situation, to get out of our W-2 and to create passive income. So that's what you know. this book taught me. It's all about a person's desire. Thoughts lead to desire, lead to action, 
lead to result. If you don't have a strong enough desire, that thought's going to dissipate into the air. And that's what Tony Robbins talks about, and that's where he gets it from. He gets it from that that um, Edwin C. Barnes story. Now, to keep going with that story, I don't know how many years later, it was five years later, Edison comes out with a dictaphone. Nobody wants to sell it, right? Who wants to sell the dictaphone? It was a machine that you could talk into. Barnes saw that as his opportunity. So everyone says overnight success. It wasn't an overnight success. They didn't see all the hard work that Barnes put into getting to that point. That hard work and that desire led him. And I think Edison realized that he had the desire with his eyes. He saw him years earlier. He saw him. He took the opportunity. He took the chance. More importantly, he had the desire and he had the willingness and he had the skills at the time to take that opportunity. Just like the richest man in Babylon, Jake. Remember when Arkad, everyone thinks he's really, it's 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 an overnight success, you become rich. No, Arkad made a lot of mistakes. He took his education. And when an opportunity presents itself, people call it luck. Barnes said, everyone might have thought the dictaphone was the opportunity. Well, you know what? It was an opportunity because he was there for so many years and he was ready. And that's what his luck. It wasn't luck, it was luck masked as an opportunity. You know you're my boy, Blue. Right, but yeah. I gotta, I gotta tell you, you overlooked the biggest, the biggest thing here that, that relates to our, our investing success. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna drop it right now on you. So just like Barnes uh, trying to work with Edison, there was no reason Gino should have worked with me when we first started. Gino was a business owner. He owned commercial assets. He owned multifamily, and I was a younger guy and basically brought like Barnes. I brought a, a lot of energy to the table, a lot of motivation, and a lot of willingness and desire. So this is what we're talking about. Your desire has to be strong enough to reach those goals. So Gino took a chance on me, really, because he was more established. I was a younger guy, and basically I said, man, let's do this. You know, We were looking at deals together. I was, I was down in Knoxville. But realistically, I think Gino was the one taking the risk there because I had no track record. I had no background. But he said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to give this kid a shot. And and, you know, it worked out, you know, the rest is history. But uh, it's the same kind of thing that Barnes did. And subconsciously, did did this play a role? You know, I know Gina read the book prior. I've read the book a few times now. So you never know how this stuff plays on your subconscious. I want to get that to that in a little bit. I'm going to – I want to spend more, one more minute on desire. Maybe we'll go a little bit less on the others. But the desire for me that I figured out why Jake was a good partner, he was a pharmaceutical rep. And I tell this to a lot of people. The pharmaceutical rep industry, if you're listening – you're not the most organized people in the world, you know, as far as lunches go and trying to get things done. Jake was one of the only guys that was prepared by the month. So he had to schedule doctor's appointments. So I would know on January 15th, Jake would need a lunch. January 23rd, he would need a lunch. Oh, wait, you know, January 31st, we're going to go with the doctors. You want to come? So he had his schedule prepared. He had a desire to make money and to work hard. That doesn't translate in his industry that much because they make good money. And you know what? Things just happen and they just happen. I didn't want to have a partner that, that had that. I wanted a partner who had structure, who had vision, and who had the desire. So I saw that in him, and I think he saw the desire in me to actually let let me get out of what I was doing and to get into something better. And that's what makes a partnership work. If you both have that desire, it really, it really couples to make something really powerful. His next step was faith. Gina, how, how's faith play into, into multifamily, and, and how did it play out in the book? I think faith – Overall, is I think faith in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe in you. So when you go talk to a broker, if you don't have our 46 questions on what to ask them, that's strike number one. But strike number two is ask them with conviction. Believe in yourself. It's not really that hard to learn multifamily. You can go on YouTube, get all the free stuff you want. It's not rocket spend, science. Always spend say. some money in your education. Get a mentor. Get a coach. Learn how to speak the language. The more you know – the more faith you'll have in yourself. The more faith you have in yourself, the more credibility you, you seem to possess, the more people are going to work with you. If you go into somebody and go, um, yeah, I'm looking at this deal. Uh, I don't know if I should do it. But if you go in there, have faith in yourself. This is what we're going to do. This is how I'm going to get your money back. If you believe in yourself, it'll translate into a success. I, I, that's what I totally believe in. One of my great heroes, and, and I, you know, some people may pick on me about it a little bit, but I love Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of my great heroes. love that guy. And he has you know, these six rules, and one of his rules is trust yourself. You know, A lot of people are going to tell you, you're effing crazy, you're stupid, why are you doing that, you're going to lose money, don't do it, blah, 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 blah. But if you know in your heart, you know in your gut that you're meant to do this and you're supposed to do it, follow that and make it happen, M-I-H it, get it done. Um, and to, to Gino's point about the confidence, confidence sells. If you go to a broker and you know what you want, you have a pitch book, and you tell them, look, I'm looking for B and C multifamily assets that look like this. 
Get to the point. Let them know what you want. And here's why you should deal with me. Don't flounder. Get to the point. Know what you want and be about it. I agree. Next one is auto suggestion. This this is this one's up the life coach's alley all the way. You know this. I, I, I work on this <laughs> stuff, but this I got I got to turn this one over to G Daddy here. So not really. I mean, it, it should be up everyone's alley because we have so much head trash. Uh, you know, I've read the book Blair Singer. You know. It's, it's all about what is in your head. And, you know, you can only have one thought at a time. I guess we're going to go over this a little bit later also. But you really want to watch what you're thinking. You really want to, you know, Tony Robbins does it now with incantations. Um, Noah St. John does affirmations. You always want to ask yourself positive, informative, empowering questions. And your auto-suggestion, I, I do a lot of incantations. I always tell Jake, I'll, I'll wake up in the morning every day and in every way I'm feeling better and better. Every day and every way I'm getting, you know, stronger and stronger. Right, you always want to put yourself in a mental state that's positive. It's always about positive feelings. It's not about this, you know, hula. Oh, you want to feel good and all. You really want to gauge your state and put yourself into that mental state. And that's what auto suggestion is. You need to work on that. I, before I get on a coaching call, before I get on a podcast, I try to, you know, gauge myself into something positive. I think of positive thoughts. One of the most positive thoughts for me is being on the beach with my kids. So I try to anchor myself thinking there on the beach with my children, I put myself into that state. So I think we all have to work on auto-suggestions. Look up Tony Robbins, look up incantations, start incanting stuff to yourself in the morning when you get up, before you go to bed. Put those positive thoughts into your mind. Gino, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Yes. I was listening to Jack Canfield a little while ago, right? Soup, soup mm-hmm. master, right? Soup, soup man. He said, and I want to get your thought on this, he was talking about incantations. And he said, you have to get to the point where you're strong enough to tell yourself that you love yourself. And he said, people get seriously uncomfortable about this. What are your thoughts right. on that? Um, it's because we're not conditioned to love ourselves. I'm, we're, you know, we're, pretty, we're pretty hard for me and you, right, to get our message out because I really don't like talking or bragging about myself. It's really uncomfortable. But at the same time, I think we have a duty because I think we reach a lot of people now and it's our duty to sell our products because without people using our products or listening to our message, they're floundering. They're faulting. So it's, it's really tough. Um, and it's really tough. You know, things are going, going your way. Why is everything good, going good my way? I mean, you know, why am I this lucky? And I, I agree with you. Sometimes it's really difficult to do that. If this was the no spin zone, I'd pin you down on that one, but we'll move on. So, <laughs> there's one more piece to this auto suggestion that we want to we want to talk about here, and that is getting yourself around positive people. Um, there was uh, I was reading another book the other day. I'm trying to think of what it was. What was the book I was reading on the way to Florida? The um, what I was telling you about there. The one in Florida. The one I was, uh, reading, I was telling you about where they get rid of the bad people on your team. Who was that? Who said that? John something, right? Jay Abrams. Was it Jay Abrams? Jay Abraham. You told That's about? it. I think that was it. And um, now I've been ripping through these audible ones. Anyways, he was talking about getting rid of the bad people on your team. Yes, yes. Getting rid of them. So it's, it's all about the people you surround yourself with, right? And I think this, this almost leads into auto-suggestion because you have, if you have negative people around you, they're going to bring you down. So you, at some point, as your team is moving forward – Keep the good people on the team, nurture them, love them, and get rid of the people that are not serving the team anymore because they're just going to bring you down. And Jake, it's not just about the team. It's about your family members. It's about your friends. If family members are constantly saying, why are you going to real estate? Yeah, it's risky. Just don't talk to them about it. They don't need to know. When you've got 600 units, you say, hey, by the way, Gino, what are you doing? It's Wednesday. Why are you at the beach at 430? Instead of tra- traffic fighting, oh, well, by the way, I did this. You don't need to hear anything negative because mm-hmm. there's enough negative stuff on, the, on on TV, on the news. You don't need any of that stuff. So try to shelter. And what's going to happen, you're going to see that as you grow and you get better in life, you're either going to pull the people who are, I, I like to say, the seven levels of energy, whether they're victims or whether they're anger. You're going to either pull them up towards your level of energy or they're just going to dissipate because you cannot be a victim and take full responsibility at the same time. Amen. If someone's saying, blah, blah, what was me, what was me, and you're like – now my, you know, I got to take responsibility. You two are not going to be friends. That victim guy is either going to become responsible like you, or he's going to say that Jake guy, he's crazy, smoking something. I'm not going <laughs> to deal with him, right? That's what's going to happen. So realize that that's what happens. He's smoking that MIH. <laughs> that's right. <baby. laughs> that's right. All right. Next up is specialized knowledge. You know, we talk about the potential power. Knowledge only being potential power. You want to? You want to run with this ball? Well, you know. I'm talking to a lot of guys in the last few years about college and is college worth it. It all really depends on what you think about. If you're going to college to get a job, it's not worth it. If you're going to college to become more well-rounded, 
to, to become, to have, you know, to have an experience, to, to learn friendship, to learn social skills. I think that's more important. The way you make money is to become specialized in something. You have to become, instead of being a, become a general practitioner, you become a neurosurgeon. That's where you make your money, specialized knowledge. Instead of being a wholesaler in real estate where you're flipping, you can still make a lot of money in wholesaling, but become specialized in that niche. Become specialized in fix and flipping. Don't do two flips a month. Learn how to do 30 flips a month where you make 10 grand a flip. That's where you're making a lot of money, where you're getting specialized knowledge. Learn a skill. College is a little more difficult nowadays because we're going into school. You're spending four years to get your bachelor's. That bachelor's doesn't really get you anything nowadays. You need to get your master's and then for your master's, your JD. So plan that course. That's why the specialized knowledge, the guy who's got the law degree, he's gone to school for seven years. He's going to get paid more. So just think of it that way. So when you get into real estate, pick a niche and get specialized knowledge. If you got to spend a year just educating yourself, it's well worth the wait. Guess what, guys? Our specialization is not multifamily apartments. It's specifically mom and pop multifamily apartments, B and C assets with blue collar and retail tenants. Okay? Check out our pitch book, it's in there. This is what we're talking about here. Become an expert, become specialized. Gino a lot of times talks about apprenticeships and, and mentoring being huge. And I want to talk to you guys out there that are in college right now. If you're going to college for an art degree, okay, an art history degree, and you're dropping 50, 60, 70 grand, is there value in that? Really ask yourself, is there value in that? Because that's a lot of money to be spending on something that, you know, may not even come close to returning that capital that you invested. So think about it. But what's amazing about the internet is if you get that degree and you've done it for four years and you're 22 years old, all of a sudden... If that's your passion, you can build your business about art history. You can start teaching online. You can go on Udemy, start teaching it uh, on Udemy. You but can start did you need classes. that fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollar degree to do that? But I'm just saying that if, if there's if there's a passion in it and you love it and you can figure out a way on how to monetize it, then I then I would say go for it. But if you're just going, just you know, if that's what everyone else is doing at all, it's not worth doing that. Buyer beware. Yep. Next up, imaginations. You know, they say ideas are the beginning points for all fortunes. Um, what uh, What about Napoleon Hill and the Coca Cola story? You know, uh, I remember there was, a, there was a pharmacist, and he basically spent, I guess, his, his, his all his money on the recipe for Coca Cola. We didn't know at the time as you're reading the story. It was a kettle. It was a paddle. It was some. It was it was a, a recipe. He was taking a big chance. He had an imagination. Um, and I think we lose that nowadays because the imagination is gone because it's hard to imagine stuff nowadays. We have everything at our fingertips. We don't have to sit down and really be creative anymore right? because everything is there. But ideas spur everything. I mean just the thought of, wow, I, could, I can buy a 100-unit property instead of buying a 20-unit property. But how am I going to do that? So the idea is, oh, well, maybe I can get a partner. Well, maybe I can raise the money. All of a sudden, your ideas start popping up. And the more ideas you have, the more creative ideas you have, the more money you make. So I think, I think ideas are really the genesis for making money. And I think the big takeaway here is that creative financing, thinking outside of the box, and doing away with limiting beliefs is the key takeaway. There's a lot. I mean, I just, I just spewed a lot, of, a lot of good stuff right there. But think about this. If anyone would have ever told me, if, if you would have told me 10 years ago that you're going to buy a 281-unit apartment complex with no money down, I'd say, yeah, right. And But the problem is, is we all have that head trash that Gino's talking about and these limiting beliefs before. How are you going to do that? How does that work? Guys, this stuff is real, but it, it's the person that has specialized knowledge, that is, has a creative idea, that's persistent, that's thinking outside the box, that partners with the right people. Those type of things can happen to you. Um, it's been, you know, I think to this day, probably our best deal, Gino, without a doubt. I mean, $11 mm -hmm. million dollar deal and literally no money out of pocket and the, the second mortgages are now gone. And, you know, we essentially own the thing free and clear, uh, except for the, the bank debt. So, And that was the idea, right? That was an idea. I was thinking creatively, right? So that idea spurned 3 or $4 million of wealth from $0. And the funny thing about it was the title agent at closing was – I don't understand. How are you guys getting money back and you didn't put any money in the deal? I never forget that. She's like, I never have seen someone just be, you know, given an eleven million dollar deal walk out of the closing with one hundred fifty grand or whatever it was. But the thing is so. that that deal, like you said, encapsulated a lot, of, almost all these steps because it had organized planning. We we knew how to put in the offer. We were organized when we did it. We knew the motive. The, uh, the seller was motivated. 
we had the experience already. We had the specialized knowledge on how to run the platform, how to, how to run those properties. So a lot of things came. Would, would it have been our first deal? No. We did a small 25 unit on our first deal with owner financing. This would have been our first deal. This is what it leads up to. And this is why the idea to get into multifamily and to get into your first deal is so important because it can lead to so much down the road. And if you have the desire to do it and the faith to do it and you have the imagination to do it and now you're going to have this this organized planning is we're going to get into next, you can see all those steps starting to, to funnel into like your, your, your first deal, getting into your first deal. So Gina, you basically dovetailed into the next one. You, and you were talking earlier about QQS and, and the organized planning. What is the QQS formula? So, so the sixth one is organized planning. QQS is quality plus quantity plus proper spirit of cooperation. That's There's a lot of words there. Equals perfect salesmanship of service. So quality is is are we are we putting out a quality product? Are we giving a quality apartment to the tenants? If we're not, shame on us, our business is gonna suck, right? <laughs> Quantity. Do you have ten units or do you have a thousand units? You know, the entrepreneur's problem is, and, and you know, T. Harvacker talks about it, the more people you can serve, and, and Zig talks about it also, the more money you're gonna make. The more people that can get what you want, what they want, is you're gonna get what you want, right? So the more quantity you can deliver, the more money you're gonna get. And the, the third, I think, is, is super important, proper spirit of cooperation. Like Jake said, get rid of the dead weight. You don't want dead weight on there. You want people on the same page, that spirit of cooperation. And if you're on there too doing it, those three will give you an awesome product and will give you a lot of money. So the big takeaway, serve more people. Everyone's like, oh, I'll do a duplex. I'm going to do a quadplex, you know, and we're going we're to blow up. Well, guess what? How many people can you serve? You're limited to basically the amount of doors, literally. And so you got to think, okay, I really want to do good in multifamily. You're making money in multifamily by having the tenant pay down the mortgage over time. That's one of the huge benefits, okay? So you don't want to come in and pay cash for these things. You're going to grow really rich through leverage over time. Okay, so you want to be able to get in and get 100, 200, 300 units. Look, it doesn't have to be that way in your first deal, but at some point, if your goal is to really create wealth with these things, you're going to have to take the jump and start getting into bigger deals. So organized planning, I think, is, is very, very clear there, and I think the, the, the translation to that is you've got to serve more people and get into bigger deals ultimately. And I think you can jump into syndication. I mean, we haven't syndicated yet, but if you want to start scaling, the model for syndication is that you're going to be able to serve a lot more people. You may not control a lot of the deal, but with the with the fees you get, it'll keep you going. With that time frame of refinancing or selling property in three years, that's another chunk of money coming in. But the more units you can own with the least amount of money out of your pocket, that's the wealth you're going to get. You can fight me on this. You can say all you want. It's just the truth. It's Guys, just the way it is. Rule. You don't have to syndicate. If you can, if you can scrape up some money together, like Gino and I did, get into buy the things right, refi them out, roll it in your next deal. You're going to be much wealthier than if you, you start syndicating, you know, a couple hundred units here or there, because you're going to have that equity, you're going to have that monthly cash flow, and you're going to control a vertically integrated platform. And I think ultimately you're going to be more happy about it. But listen, any way, any way you can get into it, you know, just get into bigger deals. I think is ultimately the takeaway there. The seventh one is decision. Um, what do you uh, what do you think here, Mr. Mr. Barbaro? Decision. Well, be decisive. I, I said to you, uh, you know, yesterday. I think let's take our time in making a decision. Let's check all the facts. Make sure we we you know dot our eyes, cross our t's. But once we did that, let's make the decision and let's stand fir- f- firm with it. People who are unsuccessful are like make decisions real quick. Then all of a sudden they regret them. Then they change them quick. You don't want to be that kind of person. Take your time. Do your due diligence on anything in life. Don't rush into anything. The flip side is Jake Some and I are problems. Some trigger though, right? Yeah, that's the problem. Sometimes we, you know, we jump into something real quick or we get really excited, which is nothing wrong to it. But just, just check and make sure that the facts are what they are. We're going through a deal right now. We're getting drip fed, drip fed, drip fed. So as new information comes in, we will alter our decision. You know, you know, what is it? The thing of insanity, just repeating, doing the same thing over and over again. You don't want to do that. You want to be decisive. You want to get all the facts, all the information. But then, once you make that decision, stand firm with your decision. So I'm really bad with uh, with quotes and and say, like sayings. But I think there, I think you're gonna correct me on those. Isn't there something out there that says like ready, shoot, aim? Yes, that's real. That's ready, real. yes, ready, fire, aim. Ready, fire, of, aim. Yeah, yeah that, yes. that's. I, I'm yes. guilty of that sometimes, but. So anyways, so bottom mm-hmm. line is, you know, at some point you guys got to pull the trigger and jump in, right? Take action. Yep, I this agree. Is, this is probably one of my favorite ones. The eighth one is persistence. You know, you hear us a lot of times preaching patience, persistent, and willing to walk away. 
it really helps out these these frameworks and these guidelines. If you really, you know, and we, we practice what we preach. We follow this stuff. This is not just, you know, crap we're making up here. Because, you know, you get in these situations and you say, I got a framework for this. It's worked for me in the past. Let me ap- apply these principles to this situation. So I think that that has really been a key in a lot of our negotiating stuff. What else uh, What else do you have to say about persistence, Gino? That's all you can say about persistence. You're the persistence guy. I'm the one following you, dude. I'm, I'm ready. I'm 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 ready. Uh, ready fire aim here. Okay, I'm on an election already. <laughs> well, a couple <laughs> couple of things I, I like to say about persistence is you need a definite plan, express and continuous action. Right, your plan has to be definite. You have to have an idea, an exit strategy. This can relate back to multifamily. Why flip? Why fix and flip? If your idea is to create a business, have it automate. That's fine. But it's not really – I wouldn't say a wealth builder. It's a little bit different of multifamily. What's your exit strategy in any kind of investor you're getting into? You have to have a definite plan. Once you have a definite plan, you have to have continuous action. You have to have a definite purpose backed by a burning desire for its fulfillment. That's what persistence is about. You need to have that purpose, right? And you need to have a friendly alliance with one or more persons who will add encouragement. You know, When you're running a race or you're working out, you're at your own pace. But when you see somebody next to you pushing you a little bit – it means so much. I think that persistence when you have a partnership um, will, will really help you out because your partner will push you. Some days you have those days you're just like, you know, what's going on? Why are you tired this morning? You get a kick in the butt from your partner. It, re- it really means it really means a lot, you know. And, and it just goes back to I think the real estate takeaway here is when it comes to sticking with deals. I don't know that really any deal that we've done has been easy. You know, mm-hmm. going back from, from the first deal, you know, it was all the, the trying to figure out the owner financing and getting approved and, and no rent rolls and really, really poor financials to the second one that we did where the uh, the dude tried to take me to a bar and get me drunk and retrade on $2,500 at a TGI Fridays on a Friday night and got really loud and awkward to, you know, the third one where, you know, we almost lost the deal that really put us on the map for fifty grand. You know, to to the fourth deal where we almost lost it over a cable contract, to the fifth deal where it was almost you know busted windows and we were getting you know pissy about it. I mean, I can go on and on about this stuff, but every one of them had like this stupid little thing that was a sticking point. Where if you're if you're weak and you you can't hang in there, you know, a lot of people say you make your money in the fourth quarter in real estate, right? You got to stick it and see it through. Oh, or the deal we did last March, we lost it and it came back to us six months later. You know, I mean, I, you literally can go on and on about these things, but you guys got to, you know, it, it's, it sounds like cliche or whatever, but, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think it's so true and just you guys got to hang in there, not get emotional about it, be level-headed and uh, and stick it out. So that's my persistent rant. You know, you just took me a minute for you to pull it out of me. Okay, bro? <laughs> See that? I'm good. I'm not even going to charge you for that, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the power of the mastermind, this is, this is something that I actually have not participated in until this year. We joined a mastermind where it's actually a bunch of syndicator guys, and we're the only ones in it that are just kind of uh, apartment owners. But I think that gives us like a, a little bit of uniqueness, and we're able to learn a lot from the syndicators. I don't know if we'll ever syndicate. But it's a wealth of knowledge, and we can kind of see what other people are doing and seeing if there's any, any opportunities for there and, see, and for us to see if we want to do it. What kind of systems are these guys using? You know, what, what are people thinking about different markets? So it's really great to get around like-minded people and share ideas because, hey, you may say, wow, you guys are doing that for that price. You know, maybe we got to look at that. Um, and it's not just about price. It's, it's, it's about strategy, and there's a, there's a whole lot of great idea sharing that goes on, and I think the mastermind for us has been great so far. The mastermind is a coordination of knowledge and effort. Oh, the academic, a, the academic's coming out right now. That's right. In a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. So when you get together for a mastermind, be with people with like energy, like I'm always talking about. You don't want a victim. You want somebody who's responsible. You want somebody who's persistent. You want somebody who's going to do what they say and say what they do. You want somebody who's going to buy multifamilies. You want somebody who's got a lot of the qualities you have. You have to think of it as a value for value proposition. What am I going to bring to the table? What are they going to bring to the table? How can we make money off each other? How can we create? It's all about sharing ideas. Remember those ideas? I mean, I can give you several examples of our mastermind. I mean, they're smart guys. We mm-hmm. talk about contracts. We talk about certain markets. We talk about the deals in the markets. Guys, what are cap rates in Charlotte? They're at seven, six. Are you buying it? And we're not I don't buying think you're getting seven in Charlotte right now. I I'm, just, I'm, just throw, I'm just, yeah, oh, I'm just I'm throwing sorry, that I'm out. Sorry. I got you. Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking like, uh, 
how about taking down a 700 unit deal together? Well, I can't do it by myself, but if I'm going to mastermind with two other guys, maybe we can take that deal down. Do you see what happens in the mastermind? And I think the idea flow is amazing because we've learned a lot of stuff on there. We've learned a lot of a lot of the, a lot of the vendors that they use, a lot of the services that they use, a lot of guys they talk to. We're plugged into their network. We need a referral. We can ask them. They need a referral from us. They can ask us. So it's a sharing of that knowledge that we have that makes that platform a lot stronger. Was this the part of the book – you have a better memory than I do. Was this the part of the book where he was like – before bed, he would have like a big meeting with like Lincoln and, and, and yes. basically – Yes, that's right. Who else was it? Who else was it amongst that? Oh, was I, don't it, was it Carnegie? I don't remember who else. Carnegie was yeah. in there, right? Yeah. And he would, he would basically imagine like a roundtable meeting with these guys and he knew their personalities. So he would say, okay, this guy was going to say that. He would, he would create like these, these meetings. Just amazing, amazing – uh, vision and and just uh, creativity that this guy had, uh, but I, I remember that. What I'd like it to do is I like to, more now than I, I did when I read it. I think I'd like to create some type of mastermind for Jake and Gino. I'd like to do something monthly with a few members where we all get together and we, and, you know, guys who have deals or who are getting into deals, especially if you're starting out in your investing career. How awesome would it be to get on a mastermind call with ten of the guys who are in your situation or similar situations or similar struggles, and you have a guy who's running that, and you can ask him questions, ask him input. That's invaluable because you have ten guys who are at the same level you are, or fifty guys, whatever the number is, and you're asking these questions. And you're picking each other's brains and you're saying, hey, listen, how's the Atlanta market? I've never been there. Well, somebody in the mastermind might be there. He might be able to add that, that, that knowledge or that value to you. So they're really, they're really powerful. I, my, my wife likes shopping there. <laughs> 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 All right. This next one, I'm not touching it, but I'm going to read it off. The mystery of sex transmutation. Gino, you're the more mature one here. I'm not touching it. It's all you wrote. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this one. But, I mean, to make it really, real simple, I think behind every successful person is a partner. So if you're married, you're a man. Behind every successful man, there's usually a, a really good woman. And behind every successful woman, there's usually a good man. It's all about partnering. It's all about teamwork. Um, and it's funny because they, they, they talk in the book the reason why most men become successful after 40, they learn how to transmute that power of sex into other desires. And, you know, sex is just like any other vice. Too much of it or being, being you know, uh, what's the word when you're Dennis doing Dennis Rodman-like? Your... Yeah, I mean, it's really not good for you. I mean, just like any other vice, if you do too much of something, it's not good for you. So um, it's it's a tough one to really to really uh, put into words. But for me, I mean, I'm fortunate that – PG here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I have a great spouse, I have a great wife, and that she's been able to um, be by my side, never really say, hey, listen, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? I see how hard she works, so it's easy for me to put in the time, and that's what partnerships are all about, whether it's your marriage or your partner yourself. You have to, you have to you know, sacrifice what you're doing and see what they're doing. If they're stepping it up, it only gives you the power for you to have to step it up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a crack at this. You 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 talked about the guys over forty and stuff. You're basically you have a better self awareness. You start to be able to be in more in control of yourself, and you take that energy and you redirect it into your business, and you let that creativity and the energy flourish. That was my takeaway on it. I'm not 100 percent positive, but that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You know, I'll get to the, to the point he had in the book where he had. He was talking about a guy who had a very very beautiful uh, secretary, and he said just. Just looking at her and thinking about her made him feel positive, made him feel viral, made him feel strong. Just the thought of that sexual transmutation transmuted into him and gave him, I guess, the power of the energy to, you know, do better work. So it's not all about the act of the sexual act. It's all about, you know, thinking positively and, and transmuting. I don't know you're looking at me. You think I'm crazy. No, but, uh, no. I'm thinking about how I can, I can pull this one off now. <laughs> Talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yep. On to the next one. The subconscious mind. Um, you know, the, the, this uh, this this piece here is about the the connecting link, and we talked about the subconscious a little bit earlier about how you know we were talking about in the beginning of the podcast about how you know similar to Barnes, you know Gino didn't have to take a chance with me, uh, similar to that story, but it, who knows what our sub, uh, subconscious was playing on at the time, and it's all about it, and it's all connected, right? What are you taking in? What kind of positive stuff? What kind of stuff have you read? What are your belief system? Because things will eventually come out and happen. And and a lot of this is, you know, they talk about um, oh, what is it? There's that uh, that law of attraction, right? That comes out later on. 
Uh, people talk about that into the broadcast scene, but I think this is actually actually part of that. Is that fair? Yes. Let me talk, let me talk about the subconscious mind because this is really, um, I think it's really important. Uh, everything that man creates begins in the form of a thought impulse. Man cannot create anything which is not conceived in thought first. Just the bottom line, Jake. You know, that's important. Wall Swaddle said in The Science of Getting Rich, uh, man can form things in his thoughts, and by by impressing his thoughts upon the form of the substance, can cause the things that he thinks are about to be created. It's really that simple. It has to become a thought. I was talking about the cell phone before. Who would have ever thought you could carry around a computer the size of that, that does not conceive without a thought in the beginning, right? So it's really powerful. Um, let me talk it's about all the, the seven. Twinkie idea. You put chocolate and uh, whipped cream together, and you got something, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it. Think about the seven powerful emotions. Let me list the seven powerful emotions: their desire, their faith, their love, their sex, their enthusiasm, romance, and hope. And the only thing that Jake heard was sex there. So let's move on to the seven major emotions. <laughs> the seven major emotions to avoid. These are the ones you've got to avoid. Fear, jealousy, hatred, revenge, greed, superstition, and anger. And I want you to remember one thing, everybody. Only one thought or emotion can occupy the mind at one time. You choose. You're even responsible for your own thoughts, Jake. Remember that. Let everybody know that. You choose what you want to think about. If you want to be happy, choose to be happy. If you want to be sad, choose to be sad. You have that choice. Thoughts are things. That's right. Boom shakalaka. So let me discuss the seven levels of energy because I think it dives into it. Seven levels of energy are really, really important. Not many people really know this. Um, go on the website if you want a chart of the seven levels of energy. I'll download you one. We resonate at seven levels of energy throughout the entire day. Guys who are successful can resonate at higher levels. They're called anabolic states. The lower levels are called catabolic, negative draining. Um, basically, when you're at level one, you're basically a victim. Oh, woe well, is me. You know, why that happened to me again, you're in that state. Level two is anger. You're really pissed off. Sometimes it gets it, – I'm not saying the levels are either good or bad because you might, I mean, you might have to be in that level one victim. You might have lost somebody. You might have to be able to be grieving at that point. So they're not, it's not a bad or good. But if you stay into those low levels too long, they become harmful for you. The second one is anger. Anyone have had a boss who, who, who runs this place like, like Hitler? You stay in that situation for too long, it's going to destroy the company. Every now and again, you need to get hyped up. You need to get that energy. You need to get that enthusiasm going. You need to get angry, inject it. But if you stay at that level, you see what's going to happen. It's just going to destroy the company. The third one is responsibility. You need to be responsible for your actions. Then you start changing. That response, that third level, all of a sudden, you start changing over um, into, into that anabolic state. Then you have four, five, six, and seven. I don't want to li- li- list the rest. I want you guys to get the chart. Uh, I want to talk about chart. how it relates to deals, though. Because your competition, sure. the guys that you're buying from, especially when you get into these bigger deals, these guys are high achievers. They're high energy guys. They're high performers. And if you're low energy, you think you're going to get into it, and, and you're, oh, man, there's a victim mentality, these guys, when it comes to competition, are going to kick your ass. Because they're up on it, they're, they know what they're doing, and you gotta be you gotta be revved up, ready to go, and be looking for stuff, or else you're gonna get the competition will kick your ass when you get in these bigger deals. If if it's if someone else's fault or the low energy kind of stuff, forget about it. That's all I'm gonna say. I agree with that. So that you know, the subconscious mind is really powerful. You have one thought at every time. So as you're going throughout your day, see what happens at every specific um, example. Something you get into a car accident, or you're something your kid does. Look at every specific example. See how you relate to it. The idea is you can get mad. You can become a victim. But don't stay in that state too long. Get out of that state. Raise your level of energy. Once you raise your level of energy, you get something, get something clearer. You have more options. You're not based in that fear mentality. Because when you're based in fear, you see no options. You have no hope. But when all of a sudden you have that little ray of sunshine, wow, they came back. They came back at 10 too, Jake. We have, we have hope, right? <laughs> so then all of a sudden you're looking at it a little bit differently. No, but, you're doing you know, backflips and push-ups because you get so jacked up, right? That's right. So well, you I really have to be careful. I might do a push-up or two. <laughs> True story. So you, you want to you get into the brain? I uh, the yeah, brain. I mean, this is really cool what he wrote about it. He said that he, the brain was a broadcasting and receiving station for thought. This is the law right? of attraction. This is Jack Canfield's you know, multi-million dollar fortune built upon this right here. I'm telling you right now. 
It's crazy because what he wrote was the, sen- the subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain and the creative imagination is the receiving set through which things are cons- received. We're walking so, cell towers. You know, you buy a car, right? Law of attraction. You're buying a car. It's a red car, Honda. All of a sudden, there are so many other red cars that are Hondas you never noticed about because all of a sudden you're focused on it because it's part of you. Your brain receives it. So that's why I'm saying if you're always thinking negative thoughts – What's going to happen? You're going to attract negative into your mind. But if you're broadcasting powerful, that's why prayer is powerful because you're broadcasting powerful emotions and you're sending love out to people. It's going to come back to you. So that's why it's really important for you to be healthy. I think we never really talk about nutrition. We never talk about health. But that's why we, that's why we have a lot of energy. In you. We sort of take care of ourselves, get enough sleep, drink enough water, You know, be healthy. Um, do what you love to do. That's really helped me out in the last few years. Um, be passionate about what you want to do. All these positive emotions lead to positive results. One little positive emotion leads to another positive emotion. And obviously, we have setbacks. We have pitfalls. We lose deals. You know, We lose money in our things. We lose employees, whatever it might you go be. You back up but the chart, though, and you stay persistent, though. Exactly. It's just a little pothole where you can get back up because it's not a big deal because our desire is there and we're motivated to keep going. I don't care what people say. They're like, oh, the law of attraction is BS or whatever. Listen, I've had, uh, a vision no. board. I've had a vision board for like the last six or seven years and I have to keep taking things off it because I keep knocking them out and you know, I'm just co- you know, collecting wins here now. The right? <laughs> thing is rocking. So I don't know about you know, the rest of you guys, but my vision, my vision board produces. Okay? Dude, I, I go to the next level. I put pictures up. I find the picture of where that, you know, because I can't read. right? So I know you, you just, for the YouTube guys out there, Gina just showed me his. It's, on, it's written. Um, Pictures, man, and I just uh, I look at. Them. That's true. No, that yeah. that's those are my goals. I tell people to write down goals. You want to write down goals because you want it to stimulate your subconscious mind. The act of writing, get rid of your phone, write it down with your hand. It stimulates the subconscious mind. You want to be able to write goals. I would say at least weekly. Revise your goals. We had the passive income goal. How much money do you want to make on December thirty first, two thousand seventeen? What do you see in your bank account? Not I'm going to make. I am making. You have to put it in the present because it gives it more power because then it's believable. Because if you're saying to your subconscious make, I might make, well, your subconscious mind is going to go, hmm, I might make. But if you say I will make, your subconscious mind will figure out ways on how to make the 5000 Well, you know what? Maybe I can syndicate. Maybe I can raise bottom line. Maybe I can wholesale and flip some deals and start that way. So your subconscious mind will always work on what you're thinking about. Write down your goals weekly and your goals will obviously change. They're going to change all the time, but I have them in front of me all the time. I have, I'm working on my income goals so I can work on making more money and write them down. It's really, truly important to do that. Just saying, my vision, my vision board's a producer. Think, think prints it. Just telling you. Got to do it. <laughs> all right. The 13. We're on 13, huh? Lucky yeah. 13, the sixth sense. <laughs> I told you this before the podcast. You know, you're, you're going to have to run with this one a little bit here because uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost there, but Gina, you're going to you're gonna have to get me over the, the goal line on this one. Dude, you're still stuck on the sex one, aren't you? I, let me I'm see if I get – sex anymore, man. You keep bringing it up, bro. You're the one with the six kids, all right? <laughs> the six sense. It's the door to the temple of wisdom. Uh, this is your intuition. It's the feeling in your gut. Um, you guys, you know – I don't know. I'm not as intuitive as I should be. We really we're losing our intuition. I, I think as we're becoming more, I guess I don't know. As we're living out of nature, that's why when you get back into nature, you're more in intuition. You're more in touch with yourself. It's you know, Jake and I tend to be more logical. We're not really emotional, intuitive. We're more of the logical, linear guys. Like okay, it's eight percent cash on cash, one point two. Other guys who are intuitive are like, well, how's the market going to react? Where are we in the market? Um, what's the property going to be worth three years from now? So if you can use your intuition. That feeling in your gut is there for a reason because your brain and your stomach work in sync. Your body is an amazing mechanism. You know when something's off. You know, communication is only 17% verbal. The rest of it, the majority of it is nonverbal. You know when somebody's lying to you. You know when something feels off. Go with that feeling. Your first your first uh, thought or your first emotion about something is usually the right one. I had that feeling. Well, that feeling is usually right because, you know, you know. And the problem is most of us don't even know we have that intuition or don't even trust it. So learn how to trust your intuition. Learn how to feel what's going on. And it's it's truly important. There's been – I don't know how many books that have come out in the last couple of years about trusting your gut. Go with your gut. Where'd they mm-hmm. get from? Mr. Napoleon Hill, baby. I'm telling you, you can take – I mean, there's books that I love. I'm not saying don't read books and don't read the books that are out there because a lot of times what they'll do, they'll take like one of these these 13 principles and create an entire book out of it, right? 
But that's why my two favorite books are, the, you know, Think and Grow Rich, and then um, the Arcad book, The uh, Richest Man of Babylon. Love, love those two for the originality and, and really paving the way for a lot of this other stuff. Um, what I wanted to check, what I wanted to mention, I wanted to go back yeah. about the six basic fears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we talked about the seven major emotions to avoid, but these are the six basic fears that Napoleon Hill talks about. And um, I think it's important for everyone to look at them and to say, well, I'm afraid of – sometimes you think about procrastination while you're procrastinating. And these are some of the things that might pop up. So at least recognize for yourself why you're having that procrastination and why you have that feeling of being stuck. Um, the first fear is poverty. You're afraid that you're going to crap out on the deal, right? That's what's stopping you. That is a huge fear. We're not going to have enough money to pay our bills or to put food on the table. That's a massive fear. Recognize it. The second one is criticism. Those of us who have a thin skin, it's not going to serve you in life. Criticism is awesome if it's constructive. Take constructive criticism. Don't feel negative about it. It's really important. The third one is ill health, being afraid of being ill health. Well, listen, become responsible. Get on an exercise program. Start eating healthy. Start taking care of your nutrition. Next one is loss of love. That's a tough one for a lot of us. When someone, we lose a friendship, we lose a loved one, that, that, that's a really difficult one. Next one is old age. I mean, old age is basically a fear where we're getting older. Um, I think nowadays you can lead a vibrant life into your 70s and 80s if you stay active, you stay mental. Look at Larry King. He's still doing it. He's like 100. That's right. Well, dude, he loves what he's doing. It's just so he, you can see that people, when they like what they're doing, yeah, there's no such thing as retirement anymore. Anyone wants to go to retirement age, once you stop losing your brain, once you stop doing what you like to do, that's when you're basically dead. That's retirement. That's my picture of retirement. So, um, you know, the next one is death. The last one is death. Basically, we're, we're afraid of death. I guess he didn't mention here public speaking because that's what everyone says, public speaking. But Napoleon Hill didn't talk about that. But um, all these fears, most of these fears, you can have a control of them. You can, you can control where your income level is. You can control how you assess criticism you know people say what, what is it saying um what people say is about them what you hear is about you very simple jake's got a blue shirt on jake what's up with the shirt jake can say to you what's my name on south beach i'm just telling you right now t-shirt <laughs> or he can say wow to drop it. if he's in a good mood he can say you know what i think he likes my shirt so it's what people say is usually reflect is usually a reflection of how they feel. How you interpret it is a reflection of how you feel, how you interpret that. So it's important. Um, and those six basic fears, work on them, acknowledge them, and see what's going on in your life. Gino brought the shirt up. This is my own personal clothing line, guys. I'm gonna drop it later this year. That's all I'm gonna say, leaving a little teaser out there. But I got another <laughs> teaser, okay? Gino is pushing me to do a live event, okay, for you guys out there. We're gonna do it. Don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it big. We're going to do it big time. So, guys, November, dropping it, okay? Multifamily mayhem. Maybe that's the title. Maybe it's not. We'll get there when we get there. But just want to tease that out there a little bit. Also, guys, if you found value in the podcast, you enjoyed the podcast, please go on iTunes. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. We have the best community in all of multifamily. Number one multifamily podcast on iTunes. Love you guys. Thank you guys for everything. G-Dad, anything else today? Um, if you haven't read the book this year, go out, buy the book, start reading it. Start He's not talking about Wilbur Profits, are you? You talking Napoleon Hill? No, Napoleon Hill. Both. So, <laughs> well, re- read Napoleon Hill, then read Wilbur Profits. But really, read it and and um, try to read one chapter, one step a day for the next thirteen days, and you'll read it all and start formulating a plan and start putting all those steps into action. And you'll see, I promise, if you start implementing all those steps, you'd be like, wow, I can see such change in my life. I have a plan to where I want to go. This is my desire. This is what I need to work on my brain. This is what I need to get, surround myself with these great people. All these thoughts will start popping in your head. You'd be like, wow, this has been a huge help. So get the book, start reading it. And you know what? Let me know. Gino at jakeandgino.com. Let me know if there's any ideas I can give you. If there's any thoughts, let me know your, your, you know your success with it. If you have any trials or tribulations, I'd love to hear. So just drop me a line. For you guys that haven't read the book, it's the real deal. That's all I'm going to say about it. Gino, great time today. Dropping some knowledge. Appreciate it. I'll catch you next time. Thanks, Jake. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.